Hey everybody, I'm your host Double M and on today's episode we're going to be breaking down UFC Vegas 78 Vicente Luque versus Rafael Dos Anjos in a main event in the UFC Apex in the welterweight division. You have a fight that's going to be violence personified with the silent assassin Vicente Luque coming back after that knockout loss he suffered at the hands of Jeff Hands of Steel Neal taking on a former lightweight champion, a former welterweight title challenger, and one of the most durable and well-rounded fighters in the entire sport of MMA, and definitely in the welterweight division, or I guess you could say more at lightweight, in Rafael Dos Anjos. So without any further ado, let's get this started and step into the ring. All right, everybody, UFC Vegas 78 preview predictions and breakdown. You know the drill. We do this every week. Last week was (laughs) god-awful, I'm not going to lie. I had some good picks with Kyler Phillips, Billy Quarantillo, uh, Abu, what's the the guy's name? Asu Almabayev, I had him. Like, there were some decent picks, but overall, man, my picks were just really, really off. So, we were on a hot streak there for a little bit. We're back on the ice, but we're going to come back with the heat this week. And when it looks, when I look at this card... There's a lot of pretty decent matchups here. I think it's a lot of fights that people aren't necessarily going to run to the TV or run to the you know ESPN Plus app to check out, but there's some pretty interesting fights. We're going to skip a few. Um, we're going to skip the Josh Parisian and Martin Budai fight. Um, I probably shouldn't skip any fights, but I just feel like there's better fights to break down, and usually you know, we skip at least one <laughs> every week, and... Um, you know, it just is what it is. It's just something I like to do, um, and it gives us more time to break down the other fights. But the main event, I mean, Luque versus Dos Anjos, biggest test of Vicente Luque's career, even though RDA is at somewhat of a decline, and um, a very dangerous fight for RDA, especially coming off of that knockout to Rafael Faziv. But we know how dangerous and how talented Faziv is in that division as well. Um, But we're going to kick it off real quick with the prelim bout and the prelim opener in the flyweight division between Juliana Killer Miller and Luana Santos. Miller comes into the fight, three victories, two defeats, going up against Luana Santos, who is currently 5-1 and in her pro MMA career. Um, I think when I look at this fight, I mean, if you look at the tapology stats, uh, 79% of people favoring... Luana Santos to win this fight. And you know what? I don't think that that's a bad favor, but I think it's more due to the performance that she had against the returning Veronica Hardy, formerly Veronica Macedo, where she got outclassed. I mean, she had some decent scrambles on the ground, went for some arm bars, went for a Kimura, I believe, was able to reverse position, landed some decent strikes on the feet. But I think that three and two, it was three and one at the time, that record for Juliana Killer Miller just really showed her inexperience in the fight game, in that fight against Veronica Hardy, who was coming back after, I think, a three, four year layoff. She was a huge underdog. I think Miller was like minus 400, and she got outclassed, outstruck on the feet, outlanded the footwork, the range management, the high kicks, the takedowns, the reversals, um, you know, just constantly peppering Juliana Miller on the feet, landing big ground and pound, um, like I said, a big head kick, and really just outclassed her. That's the best thing I could say is that she outclassed her, so that left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths to go from a minus 350, minus 400 favorite to a plus 120 underdog in your next fight. It was like the market completely flipped. It wasn't a full 100% flip, but it was pretty drastic of a change in how people believe Juliana Miller is going to perform in the UFC. Now, I didn't see much of Luana Santos, but I do believe this is her first fight inside the promotion. And when I look at the fighter's from a, a you know watching the tape i think juliana miller likes to use her long rangey striking and the one thing that you can give to miller is that she's not going to quit on herself even if she's getting beat up even if she's getting pieced up miller's still going to try to stay in the fight and she's going to look for ways to win she's going to look to land the strike she's going to look to get you tired outpace you outgrind you outstrike you i think on the ultimate fighter against brogan walker brogan walker was heavily favored to win that fight many people were very high on her And I picked Juliana Miller, and I I don't remember actually, I don't want to 100% quote that, but I believe I picked Juliana Miller to win that fight, but after that performance, the pace, the pressure, the ground and pound, you know, just the activity that she was able to output in that fight, I was really high on Miller, which is why I thought she was going to roll through Veronica Hardy, but we saw a much more composed, much more mature, and a much more technical fighter in Veronica than we had seen before, and You could partially credit that to Dan Hardy being in her corner, but at the same time, I mean, the fighter 
herself has to make the changes and you could see a lot of changes we haven't seen her since then but i'm sure she'll make a return at some point when i see this fight i think the grappling advantage and the grappling edge comes on the side of luana santos it's going to be can juliana miller keep it on the feet can she keep Luana Santos at a distance, at range, out striker, you know, land the, the higher volume, land more combinations, and really just beat up Luana Santos. But Santos has good kicks. She has decent strikes on the feet, but for the majority of her wins and the way she likes to fight, she likes to get in on the hips. She likes to use judo tosses. She likes to use trips, body lock takedowns, get to the top position, work to the mount, land ground and pound, look for arm bars. She's really good at looking for the uh, Americana from like the crucifix or the scarf position she'll go to the scarf position put the wrist of the opponent into the in between her legs kind of like you would in a crucifix but she'll push and extend her hips and push out so it'll twist the arm in an awkward manner like i said it's basically an americana with your legs and she's very good at that and she's done that multiple times good at passing into mount good from the top position and i do think juliana miller is good off of her back she's active she looks for subs she's got a good guard game she looks for arm bars looks for triangles uh, looks to reverse or sweep from the bottom. She's a long, rangy girl, and she uses that to her advantage once the fight hits the mat. Um, I think that this is pretty much a 50-50 fight. I don't see a ton of, you know, advantages on either side. I think if it stays on the feet, I would probably favor Miller, but it's the question of can she stop the takedowns, and will she be able to reverse and get the top position or submit Luana Santos, or will Luana Santos just slice through her guard, get to the top position, land big ground and pound, look for a sub, or just TKO her from the top position. I'm leaning towards Luana Santos. I think the the odds should be, I think they should pretty much be where they're at. Maybe you could have Luana Santos as a minus 150, minus 160, but I think the odds are pretty respectable with the current market and, you know, judging off of Miller's last performance. And based off of Miller's last performance, I can't back her. I was very high on her off the Ultimate Fighter. Um, who knows, maybe Veronica Hardy is going to be making a run in the division, but I can't say that either because she had been gone for so long. You don't know what you're going to expect. Usually the layoffs affect the um, fighters a lot more unless your name is Dominic Cruz, but some fighters come back and they look better than ever when they're on a long layoff. But I am going to side with Luana Santos to actually get this done via submission. I think she's going to eventually get those takedowns early and often. I don't think Juliana Miller has de has good takedown defense. She's just active off of her back, which makes her a problem for most girls. But I don't see that activity off of the back being a problem for Santos. Um, if it stays on the feet, like I said, I would favor Juliana Miller with the volume, the long rangey strikes. But I think it does get to the ground. I think Santos slices through her guard like butter, gets to the side control, um, gets to the crucifix position. I think she passes into mount, lands some good ground and pound, and then I think she takes her neck for a rear naked choke. So I'm going to go with Luana Santos as the slight favorite to defeat Juliana Miller via a... Uh, I'll go with a second round rear naked choke submission, but she is definitely going to be my pick for this one. But when it comes to a betting side, um, I wouldn't bet it. I, I don't like the bet, to be honest, from either side. I wouldn't bet the underdog in Miller, um, and I wouldn't bet Santos as the favorite. But if you had to make me pick, I'm going to take Santos by sub uh, with that rear naked choke. All right, we're going to move to the next fight so long as my connection permits. Next up on the card, we've got... Montserrat Ruiz, who comes into the fight with a record of 10 and 2, going up against Jacqueline Amorim, who comes in with a 6 and 1 record, losing her UFC debut to Sam Hughes after getting a very, very close rear naked choke on multiple attempts in that first round. I do not know how Sam Hughes was able to survive, but she was, and she was able to outpace her, outpressure, outstrike her, and just get Jacqueline Amorim to gas. Jacqueline Amorim is a girl who is a is, you know, all of her wins come in the first round. So if you're expecting Montserrat Ruiz to get taken down, give up top position, allow for Jacqueline Amarim to get a takedown, get her into an arm bar, get her into the full mount, take her back, look for a rear naked choke, then you probably want to take Amarim. But Montserrat Ruiz, I know she got knocked out by uh, Amanda Lemos, but you can forgive her on that one because Amanda Lemos is going to be fighting Zhang Wei Li for the title at UFC 292. When I look at this fight, I think that the best bet for the fight before I get into the breakdown is, um, I actually, you know what? I don't know. I was going to say that, but that's for a different fight. So I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get to the bets yet, but looking at this fight, I think you have the grappling advantage once it hits the mat off of their back 
going to Jacqueline Amarim. I think she's better off of her back. I think she looks for more submissions and she might be a little bit more dangerous. But at the same time, you know, if she can't get those submissions, I don't think she has the cardio to go 15 minutes. Maybe we see a different pace from her in this fight. Maybe we see some cardiovascular improvements. But what I've seen from Montserrat Ruiz, aside from losing that fight to Amanda Lemos, which, like I said, can be forgiven, she has cardio. She goes for takedowns. She's relentless with the takedowns. And the one takedown she goes for constantly is that head and arm throw. She's very good at getting that head and arm throw. They're very good at like, you know, getting a hold of the opponent and taking her down to the ground. It doesn't look pretty. It doesn't look the most technical, but she's so effective with it. I think that that's going to be a big problem now or a big problem for Emma Rim. But at the same time, you have to look at the caliber of opponent that Montserrat Ruiz faced in her last fight. She faced Cheyenne Bellismus and, you know, kind of dominated her. But is Cheyenne one of the best fighters in the world? I mean, maybe if you ask Roman Delidze, he would say so. But again, um, you know, who knows? But I think they ended up splitting up. But if you caught that joke in there, you know, <laughs> cross your uh, cross your T's and dodge your eyes. But looking at this fight, I think Jacqueline Emmerim can definitely get a first round sub, especially since Montserrat Ruiz goes for those head and arm throws, head and arm takedowns, and is able to control from the top. If Jacqueline Emmerim is able to shrimp her hips out, get her head out from the uh, headlock position against Ruiz, she can take the back of Montserrat Ruiz, but I do favor the cardio of Montserrat Ruiz. I think she can push a, a higher pace. I think that the striking on the feet, I would probably give the advantage to Amarim, but I think most of the time, both of these fighters are going to be looking to get the fight to the mat. They're going to be looking to get to top position, land big ground and pound, or look for a submission. I think the ground and pound would more come from the side of Ruiz, but at the same time, I think Jacqueline Amarim is going to be looking to set up arm bars. She's going to be looking to take the back and lock up a rear naked choke. She's going to be looking to sweep. She's going to be looking for the submission from the start to the finish of the fight. But if Montserrat Ruiz can survive that first round, I think she goes from a plus 200 underdog to maybe a minus 200 favorite going into that third round. I think that she can completely flip the script because I think she has better cardio. And we've seen her push the pace with those takedowns, controlling from the top. You know, even if she gets reversed, um, there was a point where Cheyenne Velismas had her in the full mount and was bombing away on her, but she was able to survive, come back, get more takedowns, land more ground and pound, um, looking to constantly work that head and arm throw. I mean, if she does that over and over, I think that she can get those takedowns. I think she can control Jacqueline Amarim from the top, but at the same time, like I said, you have to be worried about the submission game of Amarim, especially in that first five-minute frame. Um, going off a of prediction, I think that this is another fight that's pretty close. I wouldn't necessarily favor it heavily in one direction, but I am going to go with the underdog in the plus 200 Montserrat Ruiz because I feel like she can keep that cardio pace. And a lot of the times cardio wins or loses fights for most fighters in professional MMA or amateur MMA as well. Cardio is a huge weapon, and I think that Montserrat Ruiz has much better cardio. Now, she does give up top position from time to time, but for the most part, she's pretty you know, good from the top position, good at looking for subs, good at controlling from that head and arm position, good at getting into that scarf position, reverse scarf, um, landing ground and pound, looking to set up subs. Um, she doesn't want Amarim on her back and going off the fact that she does go with that head and arm throw, she can give up her back if Amarim can, sh you know, sneak her head out and then get both hooks in and take the back as she gets her head away from that uh, headlock. But I think that the pace and the cardio and the ability to survive, even if she gets put in bad positions, I, I have to go with Montserrat Ruiz. I just feel like she has more to offer over that 15-minute frame. And in a division where a lot of the fights end up going the 15 minutes, I have to favor the fighter who's going to be able to push the pace, have better cardio, have not so much better output on the feet, but just be able to push a pace, scramble better, and move better in you know, that 15 minute frame. So I'm going to go with Montserrat Conejo Ruiz as the plus 200 underdog to defeat Jacqueline Amorim via a unanimous decision. I think she drops the first round, survives it though, and then comes back to win the, the next two. So I'm going to go with Montserrat Ruiz to defeat Jacqueline Amorim via 29-28 unanimous decision. All right, and we'll move to the next fight. There we go. It's moving a lot quicker. We're going to go to a prelim in another fight that I'm actually pretty excited to talk about. A battle in the featherweight division between Francis the Fire Marshal and Isaac Dolgarian. Dolgarian coming into the UFC, UFC debut, 5-0, uh, and o, undefeated as a pro MMA fighter. Francis Marshall coming off that decision loss to William Gomes. William Gomes, the fighter who The Rock actually 
or I'm sorry, that was Themba Garimbo, not not William Gomes. I'm, I mixed it up. My bad. Um, <laughs> I was having a brain fart there. But Francis Marshall versus Isaac Dolgarian. Dolgarian is very heavily touted. He's a very good standout wrestler. Very good takedowns. Very good control from the top position. Relentless with the ground and pound and submissions. And out of his five victories, they all come inside the distance. I think most of them even come inside the first round. But he's very, very solid. He's known as the Midwest Choppa, Isaac Dolgarian. He was supposed to be making his UFC debut against Dan Argueta, which I think would have been a really interesting fight considering their wrestling backgrounds. Um, but that didn't happen. I believe Dolgarian got injured or he was sick, didn't make weight. Something happened and he had to pull out. Uh, Francis Marshall uh, got a big knockout victory over Marcelo Rojo. And Marcelo Rojo, I know he hasn't had the best UFC career, but he's pretty technical on the feet. He's pretty dangerous in multiple positions. And Francis Marshall was able to clip him with that right hook, I believe. I believe it was a right hook. Drop him and then jump on him and TKO him. I think Francis Marshall is the much better fighter on the feet between him and Dolgarian. But I do favor Dolgarian in this fight because I think he can use that wrestling, use that pressure, use those takedowns, and get to that top position and land vicious ground and pound. The minute he gets this fi- gets fighters to the ground, he's unloading with big shots, ground and pound, looking for submissions, and he is not going to stop. He has that wrestler-based cardio. But considering that most of his fights you know, finish early. I believe most of them, if not all of them, finished in the first round, like I mentioned before. But uh, let's see. Uh, does it tell me? It just says TKO. So out of his five wins, it's a TKO, an arm triangle submission, a TKO, a rear naked choke, and a TKO via ground and pound. Three TKOs and two submissions. So we know that this guy in Dolgarian is looking for the finish. Francis Marshall is going to have the advantage on the feet. Dolgarian is decent on the feet, but the technical advantage, I think, by far goes to Francis the Fire Marshall. He's very good at using his reach, using his distance, using his length, popping the jab, using the left hook to direct into the power backhand, using the check hook to the backhand, good front kicks, good ability to move. But the one thing is he's not very active with his striking on the feet. In the Gomez fight, I think he only threw like seven or eight strikes. He was very staring in the mirror-esque. He was standing there, staring in the mirror, moving well, not getting hit too much, but getting picked apart with body kicks, getting hit with front kicks, teeps to the body, and overall getting out-wrestled and out-grappled. And Themba Garimbo, or I'm sorry, William Gomez was just the much more active fighter over that 15 minutes, and he came into that fight as an underdog. I think that if Francis Marshall was more active on the feet, if he had, he does have knockout power because we've seen him knock out Marcelo Rojo, but if he had more activity on the feet, if he was an active striker, I think a lot of people would be favoring him more. At least in my opinion, I would favor him more if he put out more activity on the feet. He's got power. He's very good technically. He's going to be a better fighter on the feet and a better striker than Dolgarian. But I think the Midwest Choppa is going to get in on those hips. And he might get, you know, the first takedown stuff, the second takedown stuff. But I think eventually, man, those takedowns are going to work for Dolgarian. And I think the wrestling is a big, big gap in this fight. Even in the fight against William Gomes, um, you know, he didn't get taken down a ton, but he did get out wrestled. He did get controlled the later the fight went. And that's how William Gomes won that fight. And I think when you look at this performance or when this, you know, style of fight, he does get pushed up against the cage in Francis Marshall. He goes for his own takedowns, but I don't think he's going to be able to wrestle with a wrestler the caliber of Dolgarian. And I think once he gets him to the floor, he might get up once or twice, but I think over that 15 minutes, I think that the wrestling cardio, the pace, the pressure, the activity with the takedowns, with the top control, with the ground and pound once it does hit the mat, I have to favor Isaac Dolgarian to kind of break a guy like Francis Marshall the longer the fight goes. Like I said, if he was more active on the feet, I think I would maybe side with him, but the inactivity, even though he has power and he is technical, paired with a guy who's going to be pushing forward, who's going to be getting in his face. It might draw out the activity from Francis Marshall, but for the most part, I think he's going to be given up takedowns. I think he's going to be pushed up against the cage. There is a possibility that Marshall can lock up a Darcy, can lock up a guillotine. You know, since a lot of the amateur wrestlers or high-level collegiate wrestlers shoot with their head on the outside, they do leave themselves open for guillotines, Darces, anacondas. So maybe Marshall can jump a choke and potentially get him out of there. But I think even jumping a choke against Dolgarian, if you jump guard with it, you're going to be giving up top position if he gets out of that. And from the top position, I think Dolgarian slices through Francis Marshall. I think he lands a lot more ground and pound. He's got a lot of power. He looks for submissions. He's going to be looking to finish 
Francis Marshall from the minute he gets him to the floor. I mean, he's going to be looking for elbows, hammer fists, ground and pound, taking the back, rear naked choke, looking for arm triangles. He's going to be very active. And I think that that wrestling pressure breaks Francis Marshall down the stretch. And I actually think Isaac Dolgari, and I think the Midwest Choppa gets Francis Marshall out of there inside the distance. I'm going to go with uh, Isaac, the Midwest Choppa Dolgarian, to defeat Francis Marshall via second round arm triangle choke submission. I could see a TKO, but I think he eventually gets that those takedowns working. He gets that top pressure working. He continues to work. The first round is going to be tough, but if he can get those takedowns in the first, I think it just looks better and better for Dolgarian. We know in the UFC debut, fighters do have an adrenaline dump. This guy does have a lot of hype behind him. He was actually going to be the first full send MMA fighter signed under the UFC in the full send deal. And that ended up falling through. I don't exactly know why, but I think there's a lot of hype behind Dolgarian. He was supposed to fight Argueta. That didn't happen, but I like his ability to get those takedowns. I love his activity. I love his finishing instinct. And I love the fact that once he does get to the floor, he's not going to look to hold you and control you and win a decision. He's going to be looking for ground and pound heavy shots and looking to submit you or TKO you. So I'm going to have to go with him. I'm going to go with Isaac, the Midwest Chapo Dolgarian, to defeat Francis, the fire marshal, via a second round arm triangle choke submission as the plus 150 underdog. I think he's plus 130 now, maybe the odds went more in the side of Francis the Fire Marshal, but I like Dolgarian a lot in this spot, especially at those underdog odds. I think this is a dogger pass situation, and I'm going to side with the dog in the Midwest Choppa. Isaac Dolgarian, second round arm triangle choke submission, plus 130 between plus 130 and plus 150 dog. Let's keep it moving, baby. All right, up next, we're going to move to a fight in the lightweight division. Between Terrence McKinney and Mike Breeden. Look, I didn't watch tape on this fight, but Breeden has decent striking. He has decent power, but I don't think he gets out of that first round with Terrence McKinney. But this is a fight where you 100% don't bet either way. I wouldn't bet McKinney. I wouldn't bet Breeden at the underdog price. I think, honestly, in this case, if you're going to bet it, you probably want to take uh, Breeden as the underdog. He's like plus 210. Minus 260, almost a 3-1 to one favor for McKinney. McKinney looked good early on against, uh, what's it called? He looked good early on in his last fight against Nazim Sadiakov. I was very confident in Sadiakov in that fight. Um, looked good in that fight early. Got the takedown, got the back control, locked in the body triangle. Almost got a rear naked choke. Gassed himself out. Sadiakov got to the feet. Was able to box him up a little bit towards the last minute of that first round and then in the second round is able to reverse position out grapple McKenney, get his arm caught behind his back and lock up a submission and submit Terrence McKenney. McKenney is the definition of a round one or bust fighter if you're going to bet McKenney, which I do not recommend you do you take McKenney in round one but the odds are probably going to be plus 110 plus 120 at the most I actually think a decent look at this fight is to take Terrence McKenney via submission. I think he's going to be looking to showcase that grappling like he did early against Nazim Sadiakov in his last fight. Uh, Mike Breeden lost a decision to Natan Levy, but he hasn't fought in a year and nine months. What is it? A year and three months? I'm sorry. Um, he lost via first round knockout to Alexander Hernandez. I think it was in the first round early too, like under 60 seconds. Beat Nick Compton via unanimous decision in FNC and then beat Ken Beverly via knockout in uh, that was like two years ago. Prior to that, he lost to Anthony Romero via decision on the contender series about two years ago. But I love McKenney in this spot. I don't love it from a betting perspective, but I love it from a pick. I mean, we saw him get knocked out early against Alexander Hernandez. Um, I think Alexander Hernandez could probably beat McKenney too, but we saw what McKenney did to Drew Dober in the first round of their fight. I mean, landed a big knee up the middle, rocked him, rocked him again. But then Jober survived, came back, and ended up getting a TKO of his own after dropping him with a body shot, I believe. Um, I don't love McKenney. I don't love McKenney in any stretch of the imagination. I think the best bet is Terrence McKenney in round one. But judging off the fact we saw him get knocked out by Alexander Hernandez in round one, um, I think the durability is in question for Mike Breeden. I think if you're going to bet, maybe you want to take the shot on the underdog, but I wouldn't recommend it. I'm going to go with Terrence T-Rex McKenney to get the job done via first round submission. I think he drops him with a big shot on the feet, jumps on him, takes his back, and gets a rear naked choke. So give me first round rear naked choke submission for the almost 3-1 to one favorite in Terrence T-Rex McKenney. All right, before we move on to the next fight, let me just touch on something real quick so I don't sound stupid. I talked about him getting taken down 
by William Gomez in in the last fight with um, Francis Marshall and Isaac Dolgarian. He actually didn't get taken down, so I don't know what I was thinking. But either way, I just feel like the wrestling, the pressure, the control. I think I was more thinking of the fact that he got kind of pushed against the cage or looked to cage wrestle with William Gomez, and I don't see him having success in that cage wrestling position against a guy like Dolgarian. I think Dolgarian's too strong in the clinch. I think he's going to get those takedowns, and I think he will be able to out-wrestle Francis Marshall and lead up to a submission victory. So I just wanted to throw that in there real quick before we move to the next fight. Let's keep it going. We're going to the next fight in the UFC bantamweight division between J.P. Buys and Marcus McGee. Um, listen, I see a lot of people playing JP buys in this fight because of the odds. I think buys is, um, plus 270 plus 275, somewhere around there. And listen, I get it. I know you want to look for value. I know you think that JP buys is going to be able to out wrestle McGee, take him down, control him from the top. Um, listen, I think that that is possible because JP buys does have decent takedowns. He does have good wrestling. But the durability of J.P. Buys is a huge red flag. Actually, one of the biggest red flags on the entire card, in my opinion. And I think Marcus McGee, even though he came in on short notice, he dropped Journey Newsom, who is a pretty, like, I wouldn't say, like, he's a prospect, but he's competed in the UFC, um, um, you know, multiple times. McGee stepped in on a few days' notice and looked like a monster. I mean, he got hit with a few shots, but good footwork. Good lateral movement, good straight left down the middle as a southpaw, good head kicks, very good ability to judge range and, you know, flow in and out of the pocket. He was very, like, very light on his feet, very in and out, good movement, good straight left down the middle that he dropped Journey Newsom with and then eventually took his back and choked him. I bet Marcus McGee by knockout in that fight, and I should have just bet inside the distance because it still gave you, like, plus 230 odds. But I took the knockout because I wanted the bigger number, and it, it bit me in the ass. He dropped him with a big left hand. Heard him, jumped on his back, took the rear naked choke, and that was actually the first submission of Marcus McGee's career. Do I think he's going to be able to wrestle like with J.P. Buys? Do I think he's a better wrestler than Buys? No, I don't. But I don't think J.P. Buys is going to have the most success getting those takedowns. And to be honest, I could see him getting hurt so early in this fight that maybe he doesn't even get the chance to use that wrestling. But the smart play for J.P. Buys is stay on that kicking range, stay at kicking range, inside low kick, move around, jab, jab, and look to level change and get those takedowns. Even if you can't get the takedowns, get to the body lock, push Marcus McGee up against the cage and look to work those takedowns. Even when he got taken down against Journey Newsom, he was able to shrimp his hips out, use the whizzer, work his way back up. He never settled for position, and that was on a few days' notice. Now we have full camp. Marcus McGee. Now, do I think he should be a minus 370 favorite like he is on some books? No, I think that that number is ridiculous, but I do think he's a good parlay piece because we've seen the durability of JP buys have issues for him multiple times. Now, going into that Jay Cadley fight with Cody Durden, I was heavily on the side of Jay Cadley. He almost had that arm bar. I mean, 9.99 out of 10 times people tap to that arm bar that he had, but Cody Durden's a tough SOB. He survived. He was able to, you know, grit it out, outstrike Jake Hadley on the feet, cut him, out wrestle him, control him, and, you know, win that fight pretty decisively. I think it was 30, 27, 29, 28 unanimous decision. JP Buys got knocked out by Cody Durden. Durden's not a guy who, you know, possesses a whole lot of knockout power, but he knocked him out. He dropped him multiple times early. You look at the fight, I hear a lot of people talking about the Montel. I think it was the Montel Jackson fight with J.P. Buys. A lot of people talking on about that going into this fight. Yeah, he got some takedowns. He was able to wrestle. Montel Jackson's a good wrestler, but he got dropped a lot in that fight. Every time he got hit with a good shot, his chin gave out on him. He got dropped at least three times, if I remember off the top of my head. And against a guy like Marcus McGee, who's technical, good lateral movement, good in-and-out footwork, good counter ability, really good finishing upside, feel like he has the cardio to go 15 minutes because he jumped into that fight against Newsom on a few days' notice and looked like he came in on full camp. Um, I think Marcus McGee runs through J.P. Buys here. And anybody betting on J.P. Buys, I think you're blinded by the number. I think you're blinded by value. I think you think there's a lot of value on that number because it's such a big, juicy plus number. I mean, 100 bucks would net you over 200 bucks in profit. I get it, you know, and, and sometimes those numbers make you make bets you shouldn't make, and I think that's what we see here. I saw a couple people um, making bets at like two units on JP Buys. JP Buys is the last guy I would put two units on. Now, maybe I look stupid. Maybe Marcus McGee loses. He gets out-wrestled, gets controlled, gets submitted. 
Um, maybe, but I don't think that happens, man. I think Marcus McGee comes in here, and I think he finishes J.P. Bison round one. I think he catches him on the chin with that left hand, rocks him, hurts him, jumps on him, and gets a TKO. I'm going to go with Marcus McGee to get a second UFC win, this time on a full camp, via first-round TKO over J.P. Bison. I can't favor... JP, I don't like the durability. Every time he gets hit, it's kind of like a gust of wind and he does the chicken dance. Shout out to Conor McGregor. I, I think that's kind of what we have here in Buys. Yes, Buys can implement the wrestling. Yes, he can. But can he do it for 15 minutes? I don't think so. Can he finish Marcus McGee? I don't see it. Do I think he submits Marcus McGee? Nope. I don't think that's that's going to be the case either. I think McGee stuffs a few takedowns, catches JP Buys on the chin, drops him, and gets him out of there. So give me Marcus McGee via first round TKO over JP Buys. All right, now we move to the main card. And up first, we've got a battle in the middleweight division between Josh Fremd. Uh, Factory X standout coming into the UFC, a former LFA champion, I believe. Really, really highly touted by Mark Montoya, his head coach. Going up against Jamie Pickett. Uh, Pickett's 13-9 and nine in his pro MMA career. Josh Fremd, 10-4. and four. But both of these guys have not had successful UFC careers. Um, Josh Fremd and Anthony Hernandez went back and forth. It was a very good fight. It went to decision. Fremd almost got submitted a bunch of times with that uh, arm, head and arm guillotine. You know, um, he almost got him with that head and arm choke, the, the guillotine or the far side guillotine. Um, but he wasn't able to get it, but it was close. And it was a, it was a really close fight. Fremd coming off that victory over Cedricus Dumas got rocked early, then comes back and rocks Dumas, takes him down. Dumas gets back up to the feet. He gets rocked again and gets hip tossed and then eventually gets guillotined up against the cage. I think a lot of people took that fight, and they were heavy on Dumas. Dumas lost as a favorite. Fremd came through as an underdog. And going into the next fight, a lot of people were fading Dumas against Cody Brundage because of you know the performance he had against Rodolfo uh, Vieira, dropping him multiple times, but eventually just giving up bad t positions, getting taken down and get submitted due to bad fight IQ. That was a fight I actually backed Cody Brundage, and I knew I wasn't going to back him against Dumas, even though he had more UFC experience. Jamie Pickett is going to be a very long, rangy striker. Um, he looks to stay on the outside, land that straight left from southpaw, jab straight left, moving laterally, moving in and out, big body kicks, big head kicks. Um, he's going to be looking to land big, heavy, powerful shots, move in and out of range. He has decent footwork, decent movement, but it's just the decisions he makes in the cage. And I think that that's really where I favor Josh Fremd over Jamie Pickett. I think Fremd makes better decisions. I think he has better fight IQ. And I think this fight is the battle of fight IQ. Even though Fremd hasn't had the most success in the UFC and he was so heavily touted, I still feel like he's the better fighter and he makes better decisions. He knows where to take the fights. Um, yeah, he was out striking Treshawn Gore left his neck out there and got choked, and it was a vicious guillotine. I mean, lifted him off the floor and choked him unconscious in a fight where he was pretty heavily ahead in the strikes, outstriking Gore, outlanding him, outmoving him. He's got good striking, a lot of 1-2, one, 1-2-1 one, one low kick, a lot of good low kicks, lateral movement, faint stutter steps. He's very comfortable on the feet, has a good left hook, um, a good right hand, decent power, very long, tall guy. For the division, 6'4", Jamie Pickett, 6'2". So a 2-inch height advantage, and then he's actually at a 6-inch reach disadvantage, which is crazy. 2-inch height advantage, but a 6-inch reach advantage on the side of Jamie Pickett. I think if Pickett can keep it at his range and distance for 15 minutes, maybe he picks apart Fremd for a decision. But I know both these guys haven't had the best careers in the UFC, but... Based off what I've seen, I think I have to go with Fremd. I feel like he makes better choices. I think he's the better striker on the feet, even though he's going to be at that reach disadvantage. And I think Jamie Pickett can be winning a fight and then just make one mistake and give up a position, get hit with a big shot. I think Fremd is more durable. I think Pickett's chin is really suspect, even though, yeah, he lost to Bo Nickel. He did stuff the first takedown, looked okay, got out of the first submission attempt, you know, but then eventually did get subbed. But I think Fremd lands better shots on the feet. I think he's more technical with his straight punches. He has a good left hook, good low kicks, good fakes and feints. I just think he's the cleaner fighter all around. And as long as he can get inside that reach and range and land on Pickett, I think he can hurt him and I think he can get him out of there. Um, I just don't favor Pickett because of the fight IQ, the bad decisions. And I think that Pickett... If he keeps it at kicking range, can win, but I just don't see him making the right choices inside the cage because we've seen him be ahead in fights or look good in fights and then still lose that fight by getting clipped on the chin. His durability is suspect. 
Um, like we touched on, I think Fremd is more durable. I think Fremd is more technical. I think even with the reach and height disadvantage, that picket is still going to be getting picked apart at a decent clip on the feet. I think the grappling edge might go to picket. He's probably the better wrestler, but I think Fremd has the better submission game. So even if he gets the takedowns, I think Fremd can look for subs off of his back, look for a darse, look for a guillotine. You know, and um, yeah, I'm going to side with Josh Fremd. I don't love this fight. I think this is a fight you don't bet on. I mean, Fremd's like a minus 270 favorite again. I think that line is crazy, even though Pickett hasn't had the most success in the UFC. Um, I still think it shouldn't be that heavy because Fremd hasn't had the most success in the UFC either. Um, I would favor this mainly maybe minus 160, minus 180. Josh Fremd, I mean, he's minus 340. That's absolute ludicrous. Um, I think that's a terrible, terrible line. I think this is a fight you stay away from because I would not tell you to bet on Jamie Pickett, even at an almost three to one underdog. But I am going to go with Josh Fremd to get the job done via a second round TKO. I think he just lands the cleaner shots, hurts Jamie Pickett, drops some jumps on him and gets him out of there. Um, so give me Josh Fremd second round TKO, but this is a fight that I would not bet on from any side and with any stretch of the imagination. All right, we move to the next fight up on the main card in the UFC's middleweight division again between AJ Dobson taking on Tafan Dadan and Chukwi. Um, listen. I think that this is a very competitive matchup, but I see a lot of advantages on the side of the underdog and AJ Dobson. I know Tafan and Chukwi had that fight against Azamat Mirzakhanov, and you know we saw what Mirzakhanov did to Dustin Jacoby. I mean, dropped him multiple times, hurt him, good lateral movement, good footwork, good southpaw positioning, but he slowed down, but he still was able to land that knee on the chin of Tafan, drop him, and get him out of there. I think AJ Dobson, I know he hasn't had the best career in the UFC, um, he's 0-2 in the promotion, most recently lost to Armin Petrosian, got outstruck. But at the same time, even in that fight against Petrosian, who's probably one of the best pure strikers in that division, he held his own. He used good jabs, good movement, really good head movement, lateral movement, slipping, rolling, being able to control the distance. He trains with Mark Coleman, and um, I think Coleman's very high on Dobson. But, and then in his fight against... Oh, his fight against Jacob Malkoon, he did get taken down, did get controlled, but that first round, he was piecing up Malkoon. And I know Malkoon isn't the best defensively on the feet. He's been knocked out before. He's been hurt in a lot of his fights, been dropped, been knocked out viciously, actually. Uh, I think it was against possibly Phil Hawes. No, who, who knocked him out? I can't think of it right now off the top of my head. But somebody knocked him out early in round one. And when I look at this fight, I think that Francis... or Oh my God, hold on, hold on. I think that AJ Dobson, I'm sorry. I think he's the better fighter and I think he's faster and more technical on the feet. I think Tafan has decent power. He's got probably a better kicking game than Francis or than AJ Dobson. Oh my God, dude, I cannot get the names right today. He's got a better kicking game than AJ Dobson, but I feel like Dob uh, Dobson's movement, his in and out footwork, his lateral movement, his ability to use the one twos down the middle, his ability to slip, slip, roll, come back on counters. I think he's going to be the much faster fighter. I think he has more output on the feet, or I'm sorry, not more output. That's actually the one thing I think I would give him a disadvantage with is that Tafan and Chukwi might just be more active. He might land more. He might be able to slow down Dobson because in his fight against Armin Petrosian, I feel like he could have won that fight if he just was a little bit more active. He wasn't out of his realm. He wasn't getting completely dominated or outclassed. He was just getting outlanded, but that was more due to his inability to throw strikes and, you know, be a little bit less active than he needed to be actually a lot less active than he needed to be more than Armin Petrosian just being head and above the better fighter. Um, I think AJ Dobson is the better fighter compared to Tafan and Chukwi. And you have to think this is a fight in the middleweight division. And previously Tafan was up at light heavyweight, but he moved up because he was getting clipped, getting knocked out, getting hurt. He moved up to light heavyweight, still got knocked out, got clipped. I mean, he had a decent performance against Azamat Mirzakhanov, but still got hit with that flying knee, got knocked out, got knocked out by Carlos Ulberg. I don't like the durability of Inchukwi. I think Inchukwi is going to be the more active fighter. I think he does 
land more strikes over, you know, 15 minutes if he's able to make it that far. But I think the sharper, crisper, te- more technical fighter is AJ Dobson. I think Dobson has better punches. His punches are straighter. His punches are cleaner. He has better counters on the feet. I think the better kicking goes to Tefan, but I also think that, uh, AJ Dobson is going to have the better, more technical striking, better defense, and just overall be able to control the fight a little bit more. Tafan's going to have the kicking advantage, the volume advantage, but I think Dobson's going to be more durable as well. Um, I actually really like AJ Dobson here as the underdog. He's coming in plus 120, I think, around plus 120 as the dog, so pretty close, but I think this is a dog or pass situation again. I can't favor Tafan. Maybe he's able to outstrike him because we saw the lack of output against Petrosian. But Petrosian and Tafan are two completely different fighters. And the technical abilities between Petrosian and Inchukwi are night and day. Like, Inchukwi is nowhere near as technical as Armin Petrosian. Dobson's faster. Dobson's cleaner with his strikes. More powerful, I would say, Inchukwi. But Dobson has a lot of power. Dobson's better defensively. Dobson has more durability, in my opinion. And I think he's kind of going to... I think he's actually going to knock out Inchukwi, considering the fact that he moved up to light heavyweight due to the fact that his durability was a lot worse at the middleweight division because he felt like the weight cut was affecting him. He moves up, gets knocked out by Ulberg, which isn't a bad knockout, gets knocked out by Azamat Mirzikhanov, which isn't a bad knockout either. But at the same time, he's still getting knocked out at middleweight and light heavyweight. And I think dropping the weight again after competing a few times at light heavyweight is going to make the durability and the chin of Tafan and Shukwi be a little bit worse for wear. And I think against a guy who's as crisp, as technical, as good with the counters, as good with that long rangey striking, I think Dobson actually knocks out in Shukwi. He's got power. He's got good technique. He's more durable. Um, the only thing I worry about is the volume because I think Inchukwi does have more output. And maybe he can win those rounds based on output, still get hurt, but come back. Yeah, um, I don't think he out-wrestles Dobson either. So I really like A.J. Dobson here, actually, as the underdog. I'm going to take A.J. Dobson via a second-round TKO. I think he's going to land those straight punches on the chin, land big counters, hurt Tafan, rock him, and get him out of there. So give me A.J. Dobson be a second round knockout or TKO as the, let's see, plus 120 underdog. Yeah, plus 120, minus 150 for uh, Tafan. This is a dog or pass situation, and I think Dobson is the better fighter. Like I said, I just worry about the volume of Tafan and the lack of volume from Dobson, but I think he comes into this fight with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, and I see the promise in this kid. I see the technical ability. I see the defensive awareness and the technical prowess, and I like the underdog. So give me AJ Dobson, second round TKO as the plus 120 underdog. All right, we move to the next fight up in the women's strawweight division at 115 pounds in what I think is going to be a barn burner and a fight that I actually expect to not go the distance, which is something we talked about earlier between Poliana Viana and Lasmin or Yasmin Lucindo. Oh my God, Poliana, Poliana, I cannot talk today. Oh my God, Poliana Viana and Yasmin Lucindo. I think that this is a very intriguing fight. I think that both of these girls have good striking power. I would give the technical advantage on the feet to Yasmin Lucindo. I would give the speed advantage to Poliana Viana. And I would give the heavy power advantage to Lucindo as well. But I would give the grappling edge, the submission upside, the ability to work off of her back, the ability to look for subs, um, all to Poliana, Poliana Viana. I think that she is overall the more well-rounded fighter. But I kind of see a little bit of similarity between Yasmin Lucindo and, and Amanda Lemos, who's going to be challenging for the title against Wei Li Zhang at UFC 292. I think Lucindo has a lot of power. She's very fast, good explosiveness. I think the combination punches, the volume punches, are more on the side of Poliana Viana. But I think Poliana Viana has a higher advantage with the grappling. Uh, it says that Lucindo scores two takedowns. Per 15 minute point eight for Lucindo. She got a 57, or I'm sorry, for Viana. Lucindo has a 57% takedown accuracy, 33% takedown accuracy for Viana, uh, but submission average is 2.41. So stats would say that Lucindo has the advantage, but the finishing upside, the submission upside, the ability to finish the fight once it hits the mat 
that comes from Poliana Viana. She throws up arm bars. She throws up triangles. Um, she's always working off of her back, and she can get that arm bar in the blink of an eye. She can lock up a triangle. She can go. She's very active off of her back, and I love her activity. And I think if the fight does hit the mat, that she's going to have a big advantage against Yasmin Lucindo. She's a good striker on the feet as well. Uh, 3.5 significant strikes landed per minute to 3.97. For Lucindo, 41% significant strike accuracy rates. So she's, you know, it's pretty neck and neck, but Lucindo lands more per minute, but uh, Poliana Viana is a little bit more accurate in terms of her percentages. She actually is more accurate and absorbs less strikes per minute, 2.86 for Viana to 3.83 for Lucindo. Lucindo is a lot more powerful and she relies on that power when it comes to the striking on the feet. Uh, Lucindo's looking for big, wide, looping hooks, big uppercuts, um, but she throws in combination three, four, five punches, but it's left hook, right hook. When she fought Yasmin Yaraguay, she lost to be a decision, but it was a very competitive fight. It was a fight where she got clipped by the more clean striker or got clipped by the cleaner striker, the less telegraphed striker, but at the same time was able to get through that technique with the speed and power that she possessed on the feet with big left hooks, big right hooks, uh, big shots, just winging those combinations together. Um, and in this fight, I think it's pretty close, and I would bet the under. If they give you plus money or slight favorites, I would take the under in this fight all day. If it's at plus 140 or higher, 100% take the under because I don't think this fight goes the distance. Um, you look at the overall win percentages for these girls, you've got a 100% finish rate for Poliana Viana in her UFC career, and you've got a 77% finish rate for Lucindo. So if we've got a 100% and a 77% accuracy, hold on, you've got almost a 90% finish rate. If they give you that under at plus money or slight favorite, hammer it, because I expect it to finish inside the distance. It's either going to be Viana being able to get the takedowns, get to the floor, and be able to submit Lucindo, or it's going to be Lucindo keeping it on the feet and being able to land the more powerful shots, the big hooks, the big uppercuts, using the lead hand to measure, bang, 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 bang. But uh, Viana, I would say, is is faster on the feet, she lands more combinations. Just look at the fight with Chin Yu Fry. I mean, six, seven punch combination, like less than a minute into the first round, she drops her and knocks her out. So she has that speed, that power to put away girls, and she's fast. So the speed might be a problem for Lucindo. But if Lucindo lands one of those big shots, those big hooks, those big uppercuts, those big overhands, she can knock out Viana because she has that power. And we saw her hurt Yasmin Yaraguay with it in their fight. In a very close fight that, even though it was a unanimous decision, Lucindo had a very good performance her uh, and a very good showing for herself in that fight. I'm going to go with Lucindo because I just think that she's probably going to be able to find that chin. She's probably going to be able to hurt Viana. Um, but I would not be surprised if Poliana Viana pulls off the upset. I would 100% not be surprised if Viana is able to get into a scramble on the floor and take the arm of Lucindo. I wouldn't be surprised if she caught her with a big shot as Lucindo was winding up those hooks and landed some more volume behind it, like six, seven more punches, hurt her, and got her out of there based on volume. Um, I think the more well-rounded fighter is Viana, but the more powerful fighter is going to be Yasmin Lucindo. My favorite bet for the fight is the under 2.5, but my pick is going to be Yasmin Lucindo to win via a second-round knockout. Or a TKO, second-round TKO. We'll go with Lucindo in this fight as the almost 2-1 to -one favorite. All right, up next, you've got a fight between Khalil Roundtree Jr., the number 13-ranked light heavyweight, going up against the number 14-ranked heavyweight, dropping down to light heavyweight in Chris Dawkins. Dawkins versus Roundtree, man. I like both these guys. I've picked Roundtree multiple times. I've picked Chris Dawkins multiple times on my podcast, and you can go back and listen when their fights were taking place. Um, I'm a big fan of Chris Dawkins and his boxing ability. I think he had the fastest hands in the heavyweight division. He just had durability issues. Got knocked out by Curtis Blades. Uh, got knocked out by Jarzinho Rosenstrike. Got knocked out by another fighter in, his, in uh, I believe, his second to last fight. Uh, let's see. Uh, Derek Lewis. So he got knocked out in the first round by Derek Lewis. Knocked out in the second round after a right cross to some ground and pound strikes by Curtis Blades. And then got knocked out in 23 seconds in the first round from Jerzinho Rosenstrike. Now, on the side of Dawkins, you have to make, you have to think Rosenstrike and Derek Lewis are two of the heaviest punchers in that division. So you can give 
you know, take it with a grain of salt. He did get knocked out, but at the same time, it was to some of the heaviest punchers in that division. Dawkins is going to have the boxing advantage. He's going to have the speed advantage with his hands. He uses good footwork, good measures, 1-1-2, 1-2-3, jab, hook, cross, 1-2-3-2. He mixes up his combinations, and he's very fast, but he's not going to be at a speed advantage in that light heavyweight division. What made his boxing and his combinations and his striking so good was that he was in a division filled with not fast strikers, filled with slow strikers who were always going to be at a speed disadvantage when it comes to the boxing. But in the light heavyweight division, now you're going up in speed, you're dropping weight, which is more than likely going to affect your chin durability, coming off of three straight knockout losses, uh, two in the first round, one in the second round. I don't like this move to light heavyweight for Dawkins. I think he's taking it serious. I think he's going to be in good shape. I saw some pictures. He's got some abs, but... I don't think that, yeah, maybe the heavyweight power will translate because he does have knockout power, but I think Khalil Roundtree Jr. is the much more powerful striker. He's the much better kickboxer, without a doubt. He's going to be able to chop those kicks to the body, check right hook, left kick to the body, one, two, three, left low kick, cross hook, left body kick, one, two, three, left head kick, jab hook, left body kick, left inside low kick, left head kick. I mean, he's going to be chopping those combinations. Got big power in his check right hook that we've seen him drop Carl Roberson with. And maybe a lot of people think Dawkins is going to use his wrestling because he is a decent wrestler. I don't see him using his wrestling even in the light heavyweight division. And maybe he could take down Roundtree, but I think this is a striking matchup. And in a boxing match, maybe you favor Dawkins, but in a kickboxing match and an MMA fight, I favor Khalil Roundtree Jr. all day. Like maybe Dawkins thinks like he probably has the better, cleaner, more technical boxing, but the bigger power, Roundtree Jr. The better kicks, 100% Roundtree Jr. Better combinations, Roundtree Jr. Better ability to mix it up between the punches and the kicks, Roundtree Jr. I mean, he trained over at Tiger Muay Thai. You know, this was uh, in Joe Rogan's words, Bangkok ready Khalil. And I think Khalil Roundtree knocks out Chris Dawkins in round one. I know people think like, oh, he's dropping weight. He's going to be in better shape. He will, but his chin is going to be affected. Um, yeah, he took heavyweight punches from some of the heaviest punchers in the division and got knocked out. But with this weight drop, with dropping weight, um, I think his durability is going to be affected. I think he's going to look good from the physical sense, but I think the brain health, the dehydration is going to affect his ability to take a shot. And against a guy like Khalil Roundtree Jr., I think that's a recipe for disaster. I think Roundtree Jr. plays it safe for like the first minute, minute and a half, two minutes, and then eventually he starts unloading, lands big body kicks, big low kicks, two, three, a left body kick, jab hook, left body kick, one, two, three, left low kick, and I think he catches... Chris Dawkins with a big straight left hand drops him and knocks him out. So give me Khalil Roundtree Jr. to knock out Chris Dawkins in the first round. Um, I love Khalil Roundtree Jr. from a betting perspective. I think he should be a much bigger favorite. I think he's right now minus 200, minus 205. Uh, on the UFC website, it says like minus 190. If you can get him under minus 200, I think he's a great play. I know his record may be a little spotty in terms of wins and losses, but... I think he runs through Chris, Chris Dawkins here. I think he's more powerful. He's more technical. He's faster um, in terms of overall Muay Thai combinations. And I think he knocks out Chris Dawkins in round one. So give me Khalil Roundtree Jr. via first round knockout and as a pretty confident parlay piece for this card. All right, now we move to the co-main event of the evening in the UFC's featherweight division in a fight that's going to be a barn burner again. Roundtree Jr. versus Dawkins is a barn burner. Lucindo and Viana is a barn burner, and this is no different, man. Cub Swanson, killer Cub, UFC veteran, MMA veteran, WEC veteran, taking on an up-and-comer in the division in Hakeem Dawadu. Mean Hakeem Dawadu. Um, I think this is a very interesting matchup because... I'm worried a little bit about the durability of Hakeem Dawadu. Now, I would say that Cub Swanson is less durable at this point in his career, but he's been in a lot more wars. He's fought the best of the best. So, you know, you do have to take that into consideration. I think when you look at the striking, Cub Swanson's the better boxer. He's got better overhands, better uppercuts, better one-twos, really good lateral movement, in-and-out movement. He can even throw spinning wheel kicks like he caught Darren Elkins with. He's got a good straight left hand, good boxing, good fast, speedy punches, but the kicking ability, I think, is going to be heavy on the side of Dewadu. Now, you look at the Cub-Swanson fight against 
uh, let me see, let me see. There was one fight where Swanson got finished with low kicks. I think it was Jonathan Martinez. Yeah, he got finished via low kicks by Jonathan Martinez. Was getting chopped up. And when you have a heavy boxing stance going up against a kickboxer, most of the time you're going to be heavy on that lead leg and you're going to be open for uh, outside low kicks if you're equal stances or inside low kicks if you're in opposite stances, southpaw versus orthodox, orthodox versus southpaw, or orthodox, orthodox, southpaw, southpaw. You know what I mean. And I think Dawadu is going to be very heavy on attacking the lead leg of Cub Swanson and then pairing that up with body kicks as well. Um, I do not like the volume striking of Hakeem. I think that he can slow you down. He can push that pace. And if you get tired, he can land more strikes than you. And he actually lands more strikes statistically than Cub Swanson, but it's pretty close. 4.68 strikes landed per minute for Swanson, 5.33 for Hakeem Dawadu. But when I really look at it, I think that Cub Swanson is more active. I just think that Hakeem has more variety. I know that the stats would say different, but from what I've seen on tape, man, I think Swanson um, is a little bit more active with his movement, and maybe that's why he looks a little bit more active, but the variety and the mixing up of strikes comes probably more from Dawadu. Uh, he's more technical. He's sharper. He's a sharper kickboxer. Um, I would say Swanson is the more powerful and sharper boxer. He's got very good right hand, very good overhands, trained with professional boxers for a lot of his career. I mean, just look at, he knocked out Charles Oliveira back in the featherweight division when Oliveira was at 145, caught him with a big overhand right, uh, dropped him, and it was like a delayed reaction knockout, kind of like the Barbosa and Shane Burgos KO. It was pretty similar to that one. Um, but if Swanson can land a big shot on the chin of Dawadu, he can knock him out. We've seen the durability of Dawadu be in question in the fight against Julian Arosa. That was a fight where I wanted to pick Julian, but I didn't favor his durability. I thought Dawadu was the more durable fighter. I thought he was the much sharper striker, more technical kickboxer, <laughs> in that he was going to catch D Julian Arosa on his ever continuing to crack chin and get him out of there. And that's not what happened, man. Dawadu got hurt multiple times. Um, and then he ended up losing that fight via decision, but he was getting pieced up, getting rocked, getting, you know, knocked all over the place. And it was more with the boxing, not the kicking of Julian Arosa. And Cub Swanson is a much, much better boxer. He's fast. He uses lateral movement, uses good head movement, good slip counters, good pull counters, but he is getting old. He is towards the tail end of his career. And, you know, he's been chopped with low kicks from Jonathan Martinez and heavy kickers have given Cub Swanson trouble. Jose, although, even though it was a flying knee, um, like I said, Jonathan Martinez with those inside low kicks. I mean, Cub's not going to quit, but eventually your leg can give out. And I think we see a similar game plan here from Hakeem. I think he's going to chop those low kicks to the inside and outside of the leg. He's going to faint, drag his hip in, faint hip drag one, two, Jab, hook, body kick, one, two, hook, low kick, cross, lead, body kick, jab, hook, right, body kick, one, two, body kick behind it, jab, body kick, faint jab, left hook, double jab, body kick, jab, hook, low kick, and he's going to mix up his kickboxing, and I think he's going to pick apart Swanson at range. I think in boxing range, Swanson has a chance. Um, I don't see much wrestling or grappling taking place. I think this is a striking matchup, and I think Hakeem Dawadu wins a striking matchup against the guy in Swanson who is probably the more powerful striker. He has more one hit or quit or knockout ability. Like I said, he has the better boxing. He's a technical boxer, but he's at the tail end of his career. And I think Dawadu, even though he's kind of underwhelmed in certain performances, we've seen him be able to keep up a pace. We've seen him be able to continue to push forward, even if he does get hurt. And we've seen him to have the much sharper kicking in this fight. And I think the kicking is what makes the difference. So give me Hakeem Dawadu to defeat Cub Swanson via a late second round, uh, you know what? Yeah, late second round TKO. I think he hurts him with a body kick, jab, faint, cross, body kick, and then uh, drops him and gets him out of there. So give me Hakeem Dawadu via second round body kick TKO. We're taking Hakeem, Hakeem in the co-main event of the evening. All right, and now we move to the main event of the evening and my favorite fight on the card, but you guys know I'm a Vicente Luque fan, and I'm an RDA fan as well, between Vicente Luque, the silent assassin, taking on Rafael Dos Anjos, former lightweight champion, former welterweight title challenger. If you look at the records, it's 21 victories, 9 defeats, 1 no contest for Vicente Luque, 32 victories and 14 defeats on the side of RDA. So you've got 31 fights 
on the side of Luque, where you've got 46 fights on the side of RDA. So basically 15 more fights, heavy experience advantage for Dos Anjos. But Dos Anjos is probably at the tail end of his career. Um, he lost his last fight via, I think it was a fifth round TKO to Rafael Fazeev. He was in the orthodox stance. He fainted that right kick with the right hand switch southpaw. Bang the left hook as he got RDA to circle into it, jumped on him and TKO'd him right in the beginning of the fifth round in a fight where it was close, but I think people were, you know, expecting, or we expected that Fazeev was going to win that fight probably by decision showcased really good takedown defense and good takedown defensive ability and striking at range, but it was a lot of in the clinch fighting and RDA was trying to implement his wrestling. Now this is up at 170. We've seen RDA have some good success at 170. He took down Neil Magny, sliced through him like butter, submitted him. Uh, he hurt Colby Covington to the body a few times in their fight, but for the most part, got out wrestled, got controlled, you know, got taken down over and over. But Colby's one of the best in the division. Got controlled, got backpacked, got backpacked by Kamaru Usman. I believe that was at the Ultimate Fighter finale back in 2000. Oh, I want to say 2017. I think it was the Ultimate Fighter finale in 2017. Got controlled, got backpacked, got out wrestled. You know, what do you expect? RDA's always had trouble with heavy grapplers. Um, you know, and now he's back up at 170, had some good success in certain fights, uh, beat Tarek Safadine, I believe he beat, like I said, Neil Magny beat Robbie Lawler in a, one of the best performances of his, of his entire career. Um, and I think that this fight is probably going to give the advantages to RDA on paper because of his grappling, because of his takedowns, because of his wrestling. I think the better striker is Vicente Luque, but a lot of people are going to worry about the durability of Luque coming off that vicious knockout loss in the third round to Jeff Neal, um, the, the vicious uppercuts, the slip off to the rear side, brief reset of the stance, and then a 3-2 right down the middle that knocked him out, but he got hurt multiple times in that fight, got rocked four or five times, and what people are worried about and what people are talking about is the fact that Vicente Luque had a bring and bleed following that knockout loss. It is it is worrisome, and it does make you think, like, is this a fight that if you are on the side of Luque, you don't want to bet it because of that issue. And if you wanted to skip this fight from a betting perspective, I would not fault you at all because you don't know what kind of Luque we're going to see. But what we do know is that Vicente Luque's last fight took place, I believe, at the beginning of 2022. Let's see, either beginning or middle of 2022. Let's check this real quick. August of 2022. Um, we're actually going to be almost a full year to the day since we've seen Luke inside the octagon. So he took a year off. He did have a brain bleed. He had a hemorrhage because, you know, that is what a brain bleed is. It's a hemorrhage from all the damage he took. And that is worrisome because you don't know about the durability. You don't know if it's going to happen again. But I think a lot of fighters actually suffer from that. And maybe it goes under the radar. You know, you're getting kicked in the head, punched in the head, elbowed in the head by some of the best fighters in the world with a lot of power. Fighters may suffer brain hemorrhages and brain bleeds and just recover from them on their own. I think that is an issue that you do have to look at when trying to cap this fight, when you're trying to bet on it. Look at it from a betting perspective. You do have to worry about the durability against uh, for Luque. But at the same time, RDA is not the most durable guy either. Yeah, he's probably more durable at 170 than he is at 55. But at the same time, he got knocked out by Rafael Fazeev, and that was at 155 pounds. And, you know... For the most part, looking at the fight from a technical perspective, I would say Luque hits harder than Rafael Fazeev. I would say Fazeev has better kicking, but I would say that Luque has better boxing. And a lot of the times when RDA gets knocked out, it's with boxing. He got caught with a big uppercut from Jeremy Stevens. He got clipped with that left hook off the stance switch from Rafael Fazeev. Um, he's gotten boxed up with a big overhand, or I think... Let me think, was it an uppercut? It was a big uppercut against uh, Eddie Alvarez when Alvarez won the lightweight title. Um, so he has had durability issues. He has had shin issues before, but he is a very durable guy. I think if RDA uses his wrestling, resorts to his takedowns, controlling Luke up against the cage, then he can definitely give Luke some trouble. I think the better grappler by far or the better wrestler by far is RDA. I think the better submission artist might be Luke. I mean, I know he doesn't go for a ton of submissions, but he can lock up that Darsh choke. I mean, he submitted Michael Chiesa. He can lock up that Darsh choke. RDA fought Michael Chiesa 
Um, lost that fight via decision, got out grappled, got out wrestled. Luke did get out wrestled, but he was able to reverse positions and get into a Darsh choke. Very similar, actually, eerily similar to Kevin Holland's win over Michael Chiesa. Both submitted Chiesa with a Darsh choke, which is why I picked Holland by submission in that fight. But I think I worry more about the durability of RDA in this fight. Because it's at 170, because it's against one of the most technical and powerful strikers in the division, yes, it's a guy who gets hit a lot. Yes, RDA is going to be the better kicker to the body and to the head, but I think the low kicks, I would give Vicente Luque a little bit of an advantage with those calf kicks. I would give the boxing advantage to Vicente Luque. I think he's better with the counters. I think he can counter RDA. We've seen RDA get clipped with left hooks multiple times. Luque's got one of the best left hooks in the game. He can go palm down with it palm to the chest. I mean, when you look at how he knocked out Bilal Muhammad, I know he lost in the second fight via decision pretty dominantly, kept getting taken down, getting controlled, but I don't think RDA is near the level of grappler that Bilal Muhammad is. And I think that Bilal Muhammad would probably do the exact same thing to a guy like RDA. And I think that he can get takedowns in RDA. I think the best way that he wins this fight is by getting takedowns from the first round to the last round or however long the fight lasts, getting takedowns, controlling and looking for a sub but Luke is not a guy who's been submitted in his MMA career, at least in the UFC, I believe. Uh, he's been submitted twice, but I think it was outside of the UFC. Let's see. He got submitted by Carlos Pereira back in July of 2013 at Smash Fight 2. And then looks like it might be one of the early submissions in his career that isn't listed here, but I don't believe he's ever been submitted in the UFC. No, never been submitted inside the UFC. So yeah, he's been submitted before, but since he's been in the UFC, he has not been. And he's got a 61% takedown defense, but he stuffed 90% of the takedowns in his career prior or around 90% of the takedowns in his career prior to that Bilal Muhammad fight. But Muhammad was able to get constant takedowns take him down, out-wrestle him, control him multiple times in that fight, and that really skewed the odds. But uh, takedown accuracy on the side of RDA is only at a 35%. And can he get those takedowns against a guy who's going to threaten the front headlock, threaten with Darce chokes, threaten you know with submission offense of his own? If he hurts RDA on the feet and rocks him and RDA shoots a bad shot, I could see Luke locking up a Darce and submitting a guy like RDA. I think a lot of people are looking at this thinking that if anybody's going to get a sub, it is RDA. RDA did submit Kevin Lee at welterweight, but again, that's Kevin Lee. I think Luke would do very bad things to a guy like Kevin Lee, especially at 170 pounds. Um, I just favor Luke to be the more technical boxer. And I think when RDA gets hit, when he gets hurt, it's mainly with the boxing. Um, I would give Dos Anjos the better kicking. I would give Dos Anjos the better cardio over five rounds. So if he can get to the five through the five rounds, push the pace, use the wrestling, use the takedowns, and control him from the top position for the majority of those rounds, at least three out of the five rounds, then yeah, RDA probably wins this fight via decision. I don't see RDA finishing Luke, but you have to take that brain bleed into consideration, the beating he took from Neil, but he did take a year off. I think Luke is going to be able to clip RDA on the feet and hurt him and knock him out. I think the boxing, the counter boxing, the left hook, the one twos, the two threes, the counter left hook, the cover counters. He's very good at cover countering. He'll cover same side check hook, cover cross hook, rip to the body. He mixes up his combinations well. I am worried a little bit about the durability because of the brain bleed issue that we've touched on multiple times in the breakdown. But overall, man, I think Luke is going to finish RDA. I think he's going to hurt him, clip him on the chin with a big left hook, drop him, and get him out of there. I think it's going to be a TKO. I think he clips him with a left hook as RDA steps in, wobbles him, lands another big shot, drops him, and gets him out of there. I'm going to go with Vicente Luque, the silent assassin Vicente Luque, to get back on the winning track and defeat RDA, the number nine ranked welterweight in the division. I believe he's number nine ranked welterweight uh, in Rafael Dos Anjos via a third round knockout or third round TKO and uh, get the biggest win of his career or one of the biggest wins of his career. I just don't like the durability of RDA at this point. I see glaring issues in points where Luke can take advantage of it. Yes, I think RDA can out grapple him, but at the same time, Luke is not the easiest guy in the world to take down. And I don't know if he can take him down for, you know, 15 out of 25 minutes. And I think that's really the only way that RDA wins this fight. So give me Vicente Luque via third round TKO 
over Rafael Dos Anjos. Um, betting perspective, I like Luque on the money line uh, at plus 100. I think he's a plus 100 underdog. Uh, minus 102, plus 100. I like Luque on the money line. I like Luque inside the distance if you're able to get it, but I think the money line is good. Um, I don't necessarily think it's the greatest parlay piece, but like two-leg parlay, maybe you do Vicente Luque and Isaac Dolgarian. I think that's a decent parlay. I have a parlay up for 0.5 units with uh, Marcus McGee and Isaac Dolgarian. Gives you like plus 190 odds. Uh, 0.5 units wins you back like another nine units. So, you know, it, it's a decent bet. I'm probably going to do another two-leg parlay for the card. Uh, I'm looking at Vicente Luque and A.J. Dobson pop, possibly for a two-leg parlay. I also like Khalil Roundtree and Luque or maybe a Roundtree and Dobson for a parlay for the card. But, yeah, um, that's going to be it for my preview predictions and breakdown for UFC Vegas 78 UFC fight night Dos Anjos versus Luque or Luque versus Dos Anjos. This podcast is available anywhere you get your audio podcast. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, Breaker, Stitcher, and many, many more. This podcast will be uploaded and fully edited to my YouTube channel, which is the same name as the podcast and probably where you're checking out these predictions at the Touch Em Up podcast. I'm your host, Double M, and I'm out.